Welcome back to the Masters for 2021. I'm Philippa Guana, the owner of Media Master Coach. And this series is where we interview experts in both media and sport, not just to chat about the industry, but to bring you valuable advice and things that you can implement straight away to improve your brand, your profile, your relationship with fans and sponsors, or to improve your career within sport. Now, today's episode is pretty exciting because it covers the two main things that I get asked about all the time with my media coaching. That's being confident on camera and the art of the interview. Now, my guest coach today is someone who has spent a lifetime in front of the camera and behind the microphone. Greg Rust is a respected Aussie broadcaster, mostly known for the automotive and motorsport industries. Here in Australia, you would have seen him as part of so many different sports broadcasts from the Supercars Championship, Australian Off-Road Championship, MotoGP, the Shannon's Motorsport Australia Championships, various Olympics and Commonwealth broadcasts as well. He's been a TV host, commentator, pit lane reporter, one of the best best interviewers I've ever seen and a few years back he also created a podcast called Rusty's Garage that's gone on to be a multiple award winner millions of downloads and he's interviewed some of the biggest names in sport in the world so if you're an aspiring athlete I would suggest to grab something that you could take some notes because there's lots of tips that we talk about that you can take away and implement straight away from day one after you watch this episode so welcome to episode three of the masters with my mate Greg Rust. Mr. Greg Rust, welcome to the Masters. Thank you so much for being part of this workshop today. It's a joy to be a part of. Stop calling me Mr. Rust. That's my father. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Rusty, look, uh, before we start, I want to thank you for a couple of things. So Media Master Coach recently um, turned one and you're one of my first supporters um, for this company. So from well a done. peer point of view, I appreciate the support. But also today, what we're talking about, being confident on camera, the art of the interview, this is what you and I do for work. So for you to impart your um, advice and your experience for free, I really appreciate that. So thank you for workshopping this with me today. No problem. I have a at heart, Philippa, particularly around motor racing, which you and I uh, love, but we, you know, we've worked in other uh, industry and other sports. Um, I, I like seeing the emerging stars succeed. And what we are talking a little bit about here today uh, is a, an area uh, that is very daunting for, for young racers, male and female. Um, and hopefully there's a couple of little tips that can come out of this that might allay some fears and just help you take the next step on that side of the business. Because ultimately, 80% of what the athlete does is the important stuff, the winning the race, the getting on the podium, the getting the gold medal, whatever it might be, winning an, you know, a, um, a major meeting of some kind. That's got to be their focal point. But 20%... Uh, you, you need to apply yourself. You need to go and do some homework, research, look at mentors, other people that do it well and understand how you can do that 20% uh, and exceed in that space because ultimately it will help your, your profile, your earning capacity and so on that mm -hmm. then, then correlate to that super important 80%. Yeah. That little 20% window, if we can get athletes to, to give that same level of dedication, commitment to that little 20% in the media window, it's going to help this massively. Yeah, a lot of athletes invest in PTs and nutrition experts and sports psychologists, but media coaching is so important, like you say, because you can't just rely on your results. But like, like any skill, whether it's a trade or any other job, you and I aren't just confident on camera or with interviews because we're born with it. I mean, I remember being nervous as when I first started in radio. What was it like for you when you got first started in media? Very hard. Um, so if for some reason, Philippa, it went, what went through my head was that this almost required a level of acting and it's not acting. You don't, you don't have to suddenly become this um, presenter person or talk a certain way or um, it actually has to come from the heart. Yeah. So I think once you can start to do that in the same passionate way that you are into swimming, running, motor racing, whatever it is, if it can start from the heart, that's, that's your first um, building block. Authenticity has to, to come from that. It's got to be the real you. Everyone's trying to find a way at the moment to stand out in a flooded social media space. Yeah. Um, but, but you can't just instantly be a Barry Sheen character. That was the real Barry Sheen. That's why he worked in that, in that period. He, he had a view, he was outspoken, he was very, very funny, and that resonated with the general public. So everyone's trying to find a way to do that. The, big, you know, the biggest um, learning there is be yourself. So, so firstly, don't act, let it come from the heart, 
Um, be yourself. It took me, if I'm brutally honest, it took me a long time to understand that. There's sure there is a level of polish in in what I do in in the presenting um, at heart more than anything. And even in my my later part of my career here, I've really come to understand and appreciate this more. It's the conversation that actually connects here. So um, start from the heart, be authentic, try and make it as relaxed and as conversational as you can. Very difficult to do when you're in front of a, a Zoom scenario like this, or particularly a camera at a, at a sporting event that seems so okay. impersonal. It's not, a, it's, not, uh, it's not like you and I, where we are friends and we know one another. You've got to try and almost imagine that that camera, if you have to face it directly, mm. is your mother or someone you trust. And if it's the reporter, when you have your eye line set off to the side of the camera and you're, you're, you're quite rightly uh, making eye contact with the reporter and giving them your, your genuine time, um, you need to connect with that person too. You may not know them. Mm. So before you get going with the interview, shake their hand. Hi, I'm Greg Rust. How are you? What are we talking about today? Buy yourself a little bit of time while the interview yeah. is being set up, be it radio, television or whatever. Think of some answers that will be of value to that journalist, a takeaway for them that will help them actually create an article or a story that is of value. But nerves is the big thing, isn't it? If everyone's always nervous and asking, what do I do with my hands, sweaty hands, where do I put my hands, where do I look? It's so intimidating when you're in that environment, but over time it becomes just like a, a, a muscle, doesn't it? Like anything, if you said to me now, go and run the 100 metres, try and take on Usain Bolt, I would be <laughs> light years behind him. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but you would go and practice. And it is the same for me in, in this space. Go and watch what a Roger Federer does when he connects so beautifully um, with people. Go and look at, you know, even to this day, when I work with Mark Scaife, for example, even now having um, worked in broadcasting with him, having interviewed him when he was driving, the very first thing he does is he comes and shakes your hands. He looks you in the eye. G'day, Rusty. What are we talking about today? Mm. He's had a bit of a think about it. He will introduce himself in the television sense to the, the cameraman or the audio people yeah. that are there as well. You you garner their rapport and, and respect. And, and and that, as you rightly say, is, the, is, is a great starting block for everybody. It, it, it just um, makes you feel more comfortable for a starter. You've got a bit of a sense of what this reporter might be like what sort of things might they throw at you um, yeah. yeah exactly and then and then you go from there um i'm a huge believer in not everyone does it they're doing it more with school kids these days public speaking is a great asset if you um if you're a young sports person that is still at high school um do some of that it, it's a great skill no matter where you end up in in life and it does translate to what philippa and i are talking about now in relation to to digital media on camera and so on if you can have that ability and you need to do this when you're with sponsors and and um you know it might be a, a meet and greet scenario with a whole heap of um of fans supporters whatever it is Without signing yeah you, you've yeah. you've got to be able to not in an arrogant way but but in a just a a simple level of confidence just feel comfortable in that scenario it doesn't come easily the more you do it the better you get at it Talking about some big names that you're dropping there, I actually do like using Roger Federer as an example. I think he's the epitome of a great athlete that not only is um, fan friendly, understands um, how to engage with them, he understands how to represent sponsors. He's just the overall polished package that I think any aspiring athlete should want to become like in their demeanor and their interactions with others. What are some of the big name um, celebrities or sporting athletes that you've worked with that have been great on camera, great to chat with, but why? What was it about their rapport or their demeanor or the way that they spoke with you that made them a person that you wanted to interview? Uh, Mario Andretti is one that springs to mind, one of the all-time greats of, of motor racing from uh, Formula One to uh, IndyCar especially and more. Um, he was just such an engaging man. We sat on the pit wall uh, of the Gold Coast when the IndyCar race was on up there. Uh, he didn't really know me and, and I you know, was just sort of in awe of this opportunity to talk to one of the all-time motor racing greats and he couldn't have been... Um, more grounded, more um, engaging in, in, in every way. People like Roger, who you've just um, used as an example, Mario is another great one. They have this wonderful appreciation of the sports history too. And that's another thing I would encourage the athletes to do is to, to know your place in all of that, to understand 
uh, the realm that you are moving into and potentially representing and the people that have come before you and have helped build it to what it is now and the responsibility that you kind of take in, in being the next era, the next wave. So uh, yes, use those people as benchmarks. I mean, I've had some other funnier ones. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger at the Australian Formula One Grand Prix. Um, what would you like? Uh, crazy. I mean, he, he was so, um, I, I, it almost ends up feeling like um, you're witnessing one of his movie scenes. He'd been on the grid <laughs> at the start of the Formula One race. I said, oh, what was it like? And, oh, the power was amazing, you know, and things like that. Um, and it, it ends up it ends up like a, uh, a little 10 second grab, maybe maybe a couple of questions at best, and then he, he moves on, they're, they're so busy. Um, try yeah. if you can, try if you can not to be daunted by the person. They're a human being. They get yeah. up every day, they put their, their trousers on this one leg at a time, like we do. Um, Yes, they've achieved a, a, a lot of things. And in, in the media case, they may be a very significant reporter. They may be outside the realm of our sport. They could be from uh, a business, general news, things like that. If, related. Yeah. Uh, and if, if you go with, uh, if you're fortunate enough to be in, in a sport or a team scenario that has a layer of that help, um, a, a communications person or, or someone significant um, in the team, Talk to them beforehand. Yeah. What, um, what, what is this going to be about? What's our objective here? Un that's a really good point that you make because I find that that's one resource that young athletes forget to tap into, particularly with my work overseas in F4 UAE. Sometimes I won't have my kids talk to me until round three. But obviously, as a communications manager, I do my research on all of the athletes that are part of the championship, but I'm also there to promote their successes and their stories. So don't be afraid to, like you're right, the comms manager of your team, the comms manager of the category that, that you're competing in, because all of those people are more than willing to give you some advice or open up some doors for you to build your profile and, and ease some of those um, uncomfortable scenarios for you. I reckon it's a two-way street, Philippa. Firstly, if you get on the forward foot like that and you go to the comms person, introduce yourself, talk to them, um, ask them what you can do to help, and, and particularly yeah. if you're scheduled to do a, 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 you know, an interview of some kind, it, it helps you in that process. But you're also forging a relationship with this person and they then become a go-to. So right. if, they, if they see that you're proactive, you want to do more of this, um, they'll help you on that side. And similarly, as you as you prepare and... Um, uh, and want to get better, they're going to give you some 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 key bits of information that, that are going to help you to, mm. to get a result when you're talking to that journalist. Then think more broadly. You've introduced yourself to the journalist and, and the cameraman. You're getting set up here. If you've had a conversation with the comms person, we know that the, you know, the, the two or three key messages that we want to get away are... Uh, you know, whatever it is, um, your your, your co-driver that you're going to be with at um, at Bathurst or some other significant news, you know that's your deliverable that you've got to do. Yeah. But then, how else? How else can we get a result for the people that are supporting us? Well, firstly, we turn up on time. If the meeting is at eleven o'clock today for Philippa and I for this chat, you, you're on the Zoom a minute or two beforehand. Good to go. Yeah. You're dressed nicely in the relevant team apparel. Make sure it's it's ironed. It looks good, like, you know, stop and check on camera. Does it look right? Can we see the, the you know, the, the sponsor in some way? And sometimes you need to make it subtle. Walk into your team environment in the haste of getting set for these things because invariably the journalist has got a number of interviews they've probably got to do on the day. Have a think about what's going to be in the background. Don't, don't um, you know, look at what you've got there today with the, with the you know, the media master coach wall behind you. What about, the, you know, um, a, a race car, nicely positioned, people out of the way so they're not going to be intrusive um, and then you're you're subtly then reinforcing your sponsors as you go without even trying correct and that's one of the questions a lot of athletes ask well how many times do i need to mention my sponsor in the answer if you've got your sponsor on your uniform if you've got the sponsored branding on pet walling or um, on the race car that you said or there's something that's visible yeah you can thank them at the end if you really wanted to but if you've got that visual presence behind you then they're getting that value for the two or three minutes that you're on camera they're still getting um, representation in the interview without you even having to say anything that subtlety to me is far more powerful than a verbal. Um, a, a verbal mention, as you say, on, on a podium um, in a moment of celebration, that's great. No problem at all. But in the example of an interview that we've started with here, um, 
just subtle reinforcement of the sponsor in the background. What the journalist really wants from you is a nugget, a takeaway comment um, uh, story. thing thing that they can they can use to build their story. That's what they really want. That's their objective. So so your objective is to, to make a, a point about something. Their objective is to get that, that comment, whatever it is. The other stuff that's happening in the background will, will subtly get you the miles because if that story ends up um, digitally somewhere on the news, you know, getting likes and shares, you've got a result. If you don't give them something of value in your answer, it, it just it's very likely, as that old saying goes, to hit the cutting room floor. Another thing too in this day and age with the pandemic and a lot of athletes doing Zoom interviews, particularly whether it's Aussies overseas and can't get back for a live in-studio TV broadcast, for example, if you're at a home office, we don't want to see garbage behind. We don't want to see general. If you've got walls, you can put posters up that have got team sponsorship or a racing cap or your helmet. Always think about what's behind you. If you are at home, you need to create like your own little studio, but that's where you need to also include your, your sponsors. I mean, it's it has changed our world in the past 12 months, yeah. COVID, and I'm a big believer in trying to be a little bit glass half full about some of the positives to come out of it. So that that whole Zoom based thing, I'm I'm yeah. I'm, tra I'm traveling today, so so I, I'm not where I would normally be, and this background is very basic, and I actually hope it serves to those of you watching as a great example in some ways of of what not to do. What what Philippa has behind it, you could do you could do very inexpensive things that are ultimately going to help you because there's, there's going to be a lot more of this stuff no matter what, what comes out of the pandemic. People are going to do more of this. So try looking at one of those uh, influencer style round lights that beam a bit more light back on your face behind the computer. That's not vanity. That is an asset. That is a thing that is going to help you. The background that you have behind you can be done very inexpensively. You can dress your office in a certain way with a bit of memorabilia. Could be yours. Could be someone that you aspire to be like that, that maybe has uh, been a mentor for you. You can very easily create something that is a nice background that cements who you are, what you're about and the, and the game that you play when we were starting to see a lot more sim racing broadcasts at home, particularly when supercars took the initiative of doing that in 2020 during the pandemic while there was no on-track competition, you could tell the athletes that were with it and those who understood it because all of their sponsor logos were beautifully positioned. I actually shared a, a post of Scotty McLaughlin. He had all of his DJR Team Penske sponsors on these sponsor boards. Some other drivers just had plain walls and that is a missed opportunity from a media point of view Every opportunity to be on camera is an opportunity to give an extra little bit of love to all of the sponsors that you're involved with. Come back to what we talked about at the very top of this, 80-20. You want to be the guy in the sim racing example that's winning races and getting a bit of coverage, whatever it might be. But that little 20% investment that Scotty, Shane Van Gisbergen, and others yep. that, you're, that you're detailing there made in setting up their, their, uh, their, their simulator, but also the backdrops and things around it so it looked good on Twitch and places like that. That's that's an investment uh, in your time, in your brand, um, and it also, you know, when when you're with a professional race team, uh, you have a responsibility in. I mean, in everything they do, from the way they um, prepare, you know, prepare their cars or motorbikes, the ga the garage setup, you are a part of that. So, in the in the sim example that you're giving them, the more you can can um, recreate that look or make it in keeping with what they're doing in the real racing sense is vitally important. Let's talk about some specifics now and about speaking because the hardest thing for young ones in particular, they think that there's this expectation that they have to speak professionally because they're in this pro sport. But at the end of the day, you're just having a conversation with one other person and you're speaking about the best thing that you know about and that's yourself. And, and Philippa, use all of your assets. Um, I did an interview with Joey Mawson at the weekend, who's just won the Australian Drivers Championship. He has this, this unbelievably beautiful smile that is very disarming. That is naturally him. Let that come through. Don't be so uh, stiff because of, you know, this is a, what seems like a serious interview and what is this camera that I can't really connect with. Try and relax, drop your shoulders, use your eyes, keep that smile. If it's, if it's a, a topic of... Um, of happy conversation, let that come through. To your point, try as you get better with this to um, eliminate what I would call safety words. So sometimes people 
buy themselves a little ticket mentally to get to the point where they, they can then say the next important thing. So try and relax. Don't, you know, if you, if it's the, the safety word might be, oh, I really, really love talking to Philippa and I really, really love, and you know, the, the <laughs> yeah, so some, yeah. You, know, you know where I'm going? Okay. Yeah, and, it's, and, and, it's a, step, and, a stepping stone buys your time. It buys your time. And everyone has that. I, I've had that safety word as well. Try and find a different way to say it. Watch, as we said before, um, a, a couple of people you aspire to. How do they do it? Mm -hmm. You don't have to copy um, Roger Federer, but maybe there's some takeouts in the way that he does it that would work for you. Yeah. Um, offer something of, of value. Connect personally with the, the reporter and understand the parameters, which is probably, I'm maybe jumping forward here, which what you're about to get to. In that hello and, and meeting with the, the journalist or the reporter, understand what this is for. Yeah. If it's for nighttime news, it might be that they've only they only need a little fifteen second comment. It, you won't get much more to ten seconds. Sometimes is I mean, but they're talking now on social media that our attention span is eleven seconds. If you can't get them in the first eleven seconds, you're gone. Yeah. So so think of some words in your answer that are going to be nice and succinct, like that. Still personalised, so you're talking in a conversational way um, to the reporter. Um, if it is for nighttime news. Don't personalise it to the point where you say, oh, well, Philippa, so-and-so. If it's a longer form interview where it's going to be part of a broadcast and that reporter is clearly the only one doing it, that's okay to connect with them and to say that. And I actually like the notion of, of, of doing that. If you show that you've done a bit of homework, you know who the reporter is, you're kind of connecting with them. Hey, hey, thanks, Stubbsy, or, or um, you know, thanks, whoever. That's really good. That's, that's, a, that's one little, little solid step in personalising the interview. Please be, uh, please be aware, although um, people watching at home may not know you from a bar of soap, for whatever reason, the camera is very good, very good at helping them pick a fake. If, yeah. you're, not, if you're not genuine, uh, your, your, your body language and, and what you do, that comes through. And your, it comes through in your words as well. So, so genuineness... Um, it has to be key in, in, in all of this. That, that's a good starting point. Another thing that it's okay for an athlete to ask the reporter is, how much do you need from me? Like you said before, are you, do you need me to talk for a minute? Do you need me to talk for 20 seconds? The journalist is actually quite impressed that you are asking specifically what they need. And if you can deliver what a journalist need, the journalist is going to like you and keep you on the books as a as an option for future interviews as well. If you can do that, then they'll they'll come back to you. Exactly, exactly. If they if they know that you're going to offer up something quality in your answers, firstly, that nugget that we talked about before, you're you become a good go to. And if you can um, articulate yourself in in such a way where you you're not stumbling over words and you connect with your eyes and your smile and things like that they will start to come back to you because you you um, you resonate. And it's good to understand whether you're live or whether you're pre-recorded because sometimes young athletes don't know whether a camera is hooked up to a Wi-Fi signal, um, to a TV station or not. Because if you aren't going live, then the nerves can relax even more because if you do make a mistake, it's okay because the journalist is going to ask you the question again and you can start from scratch. Like a lot of the times when athletes I've interviewed get really nervous, like it's okay, you make a mistake, no problem. We'll just do it again. We'll just carry on. Because when you're interviewing something, somebody, Rusty, you're not just asking a question for them to answer. You're listening to what they're saying as well because you're working out how that answer can fit into a video package on TV or into a, a news story on a radio station, right? Absolutely. I mean, half the time I'll have heard in the answer what I need and that will determine whether I continue the interview to perhaps ask the question again yeah. another way. So you might be able to give me a, a, a shorter or better answer. Yeah. Um, I understand where you need to look. Right now I'm talking to you via Zoom because we can connect face to face. Uh, nine times out of 10, the reporter will be standing off to the side. You will look at, at an angle to the camera. Yeah. Don't, don't do that. In that moment, <laughs> oh, no. it's, not, it's, it's not about that. You must connect with the reporter in that example. If it was Sunrise or the Today Show and they came to you and said, we're going to do a live cross from the studio, you look straight down the barrel. Yeah. That, that barrel is your friend. Somehow, as we said, imagine it's, the, the, it's your mother. Try and know the people at the other end of that live cross. Yes, Carl. Yes, Koshi, whoever that might be. Um, and... 
uh, use those assets, smile, look down the barrel and, and hold it until they tell you it's done, until yeah. they tell you it's finished. Don't look, don't look, you know, where are we done here? Are we right? Try and just hold it and, and they'll tell you when you're clear. These are really good specifics because usually it's towards the end of a sentence that the athlete like looks at the camera like, was that all right? It's like, no, exactly. don't exactly. turn off because we need to have the whole package polished. Another thing, while we're creating this checklist of things, I hope everyone's taking notes here because there's lots of really good um, tips to remember. When an interviewer like you asks a question, tell us about your race. Don't just say, yeah, it was good, right? Exactly. Because what, what can you do with that? And there's, there's two two things that I normally advise, and I'm sure you would be the same thing to your the athletes that come to you. Use part of the question at the beginning of your answer so it stays in context, right? De so if definitely. it's used on its own, people know what you're talking about. Yeah, that's a great starting point because it helps you launch into a thought train of what your answer should be. Firstly, to your point a moment ago about the reporter, a good reporter will help allay your fears. Mm -hmm. They will they will help guide you. Um, I, I did one for Channel 7 News the other day on the travel bubble between New Zealand and Australia. And he, he kind of laughed and joked about, um, oh, it's okay. And, and um, I'll look after you. And don't worry, this is all pre-recorded because <laughs> I had all this, you know, experience. We had a bit of a laugh about it. But, yeah. but actually... Um, in a real world scenario with a, a new athlete, and there'll be many that might be watching this, that that's a good reporter, a good yeah. reporter helping to, to settle you in, in that regard. So I, I just think that, you know, I come back to some fundamentals, authenticity, have a think about the kind of answer that you want to um, offer up here, try and understand in the pre game, where the reporter might take this, where might they take this, this interview, what, what are they going to do? Understand if it's live, pre recorded, do they need shorter, long form answers and, and look at some of those athletes, the ones that do it well, and how can that apply to me and the person that I am? You can, in, in the, the realm of the sporting landscape, if you're the emerging athlete, you have to be very careful that, that what you say um, isn't offensive to those that have the proper runs on the board that are the proper champions. But that doesn't mean you can't have a view. You can very carefully articulate your view, even if it is perhaps indifference to them or if there is some sort of moment of tension with them, you can very respectfully acknowledge who that person is in the sense of the sports history or landscape, but still make your point known. When you are in the early stages of your career, working with new sponsors all the time, you will be approached by um, industry specific press. You may also be approached by business magazines or it could be a, an industry related side avenue of media. So you do also need to ask, can I speak shop? Can I speak in my sporting code or you know, is this going to the masses like night, nightly news or you know, in the case of you know, women in motorsport, right? So I'll be speaking to a motorsport specific publication or is this just someone that wants to write a story about chicks in sport? Then you can be a little bit more less specific with your answers so that people understand what you're saying. That's also something to remember as well, isn't it? When you're most, this breadth of different media. Most definitely. And we're in a world that has created um, new words for things that I'm still learning with my teenage kids. Uh, we've got acronyms everywhere and yes, lots, acronyms. Of, lots of different, lots of different sports. Uh, super important, even if it's not industry to understand right up there, who is my audience here? Mm. Who are we going to? Are these enthusiasts? who yeah. love their motor racing. And it's okay to have a couple of those acronyms in there because they know it. If it's an industry that has nothing to do with automotive or motorsport in that example, um, well, then you, you need to have a level of, of explanation and think about the fact that I'm, I'm not talking necessarily to the dyed in the wool or the converted, um, you, you know, uh, fan of that space. Give them a little explanation so you take them on that that uh, that you embrace them bring them with you yeah and still at the end of the day no matter how you perform in that interview you are an extension a representation of not just yourself but your sponsors the sporting code so if you're a really um enthusiastic athlete and you've got a great personality like scotty mclaughlin right so he's excited to win his first race or get on the podium in indycar and he's just got this great enthusiasm if no one's watched IndyCar before, they might say, oh, I like this kid. I might watch a race. So already you're, you're converting potential new, 
new fans to your sport as well, which just grows, you know, your fan base, the audience for your sponsors. So it all works hand in hand, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And, and you know, it, it is a tricky world right now and, and uh, lots of, um, you know, in the social media space and in other areas, everyone's got a viewpoint. Just, just if you can, pull the blinkers off a little bit and think of two things. Who am I? What am I about? And what do I represent? But yes. also, who are the people that are, that are with me on this journey? And they might be direct sponsors from your team personally. They might be a category or industry people. And that enables you to think about how far you can go with your answers. So in the Peter Adderton example, he's, a, a, he's the owner of an American telco, uh, an Aussie guy. Um, he, he likes uh, straight shooting from the hip style of, of answers. He, he wants that, that realness. He doesn't want it to be, um, you know, sanitized in a way. He likes that. So that's great. So if you know that you've got the backing of, a, of someone like that, well, you can open up and shoot from the hip a little bit more. If you're representing other brands that are perhaps a bit more uh, conservative, you know, you need, to have a, you need to have a little think about that. But somewhere is the, you know, it's a, it's a tightrope, Philippa, that we walk with some of this stuff because you still need to be you. I'm absolutely adamant about that. But you do in the back of your mind just need to have a little bit of a think about that. They're the people paying the bills here. Right. And, and you know, they do have... Um, uh, you know, viewpoints on certain things. Um, so just, you need to just keep that, don't over cloud yourself with all that stuff as a, as a junior athlete, but as you prepare in the same way that you prepare for the, the you know, the Australian Tennis Open or the Bathurst 1000 or whatever, and all the great work that goes into that, just give yourself a little bit of time to think about some of this stuff as, as well. How can I, as I said before, give value to the sponsors with an answer that will get picked up by the media, but that is still fitting within who I am and what they stand for. Yeah, great advice. And no yeah, nahs. Absolutely. That, I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you know what, I thought fair, was oh. what, what, what I thought was terrific was when Lando Norris came and did the guest appearance in the Supercars uh, E-Series and, and he, he, in a post-race interview, threw those in deliberately because it was kind of seen as this, as this Aussie Vanessa. way. And Gia, Gia made me laugh. But, yes, if you can avoid things like that, they are habitual things we pick them up over life in you know where we've gone to school or the people that we're around try and gradually just eliminate that stuff just think about a way that you can speak naturally conversationally mm -hmm. but just with that tiny little bit of polish that removes that stuff because it's really noticeable on the ear for the audience at home and it stands Absolutely. out it stands out makes no sense it's just a crutch that we all we all fall for it's it's okay to pause if an interviewer was asking you a question the worst thing to do is go yeah nah well the race was um sort of because that is the the worst um impression to make because you never know where that interview is going to go and firstly I would never use an answer like that anyway I would stop the athlete again and say okay let's just start from scratch this is why particularly if you're in a pre-recorded scenario you you actually can do that but I suppose it comes to a point my next point is that a lot of athletes go, why are you asking me this question three times? Because they, young athletes don't want to talk a lot anyway, right? They just want to get the answer and get it over and done with. But if you're not providing the content succinctly and conversationally that we can use, we will ask the question a couple of times until it at least makes them look good as well. We're, we're thinking about their reputation too, not just about the answer that we're thinking about. Correct. So don't think of it as I got to the finish line. Whew, I got that answer out, <laughs> box ticked. Yeah. What is actually going to tick the box is the quality of the answer you give, perhaps the succinctness, if it's got to be in a certain window. If it's for news and your comment is 30 seconds, it'll never get a run, right? Or worse, they might chop it in half and only use part of it. So just hopefully that part they pick keeps you in context. So um, have a think about it. In, in that lead up, when you are driving to the interview, when you've spoken with your communications person beforehand, when you've met the reporter, you've bought yourself a bit of time to have done some research, to have a think about the answers, to know the media space where it is going to run and to deliver something. And if they ask it two or three times, think of another way to articulate it so you get that result for them, mm. um, but stay on point. Stay on point. If they're trying to drag you in a certain direction, uh, you know from having spoken with the, the people in your sport or your team that the message is this, particularly if it's something conversational. Mm. If you've expressed a view, don't change that view. Stay on message. Stay on point. Okay. 
don't be intimidated as well. No, correct. It's, it's you, okay. you are in control. Yeah, correct. This, this is your profile. It's your brand. It's your career. You do want to have the best opportunities to promote yourself. So don't allow, like I said, someone to walk you down the garden path on a subject that's completely irrelevant. Well, and, and you don't have to use the term no comment because sometimes no comment can have this perception of, well, why aren't you committing to that or, or, or what have you got to hide? You can use the other assets that you've naturally got to steer the, the conversation back to where you need it to go. You can still absolutely offer a viewpoint on, on some of those very important things in our society right now, but, but use that smile, redirect yourself back to the message that you want to yeah. give that's important to you and to your sponsors and the sport and, and so on. Um, using your eyes to connect with the reporter or, or if it's down the barrel, you, you can very easily steer this back to a place where you, the person being interviewed, are comfortable. That is not arrogance. That is that is just, you know, carrying it in yourself, knowing that this is this is you being interviewed here. What you say is is uh, ultimately important for your sport, your brand, etc. Take it back to a place where you feel feel comfortable with that again. Let's talk about just some checklist stuff. So you have, if you're if you're going on camera, right? So if a, if a TV camera crew comes to visit you at a racetrack and you're you're the champion, like Joey was on the weekend, a few checklists. When you speak to the reporter, where am I looking? What are we talking about? Um, how much do you need me to speak? What's this going to be used for? Make sure your uniform or your shirt's all neatly represented. Make sure you've got no stuff on your face. Like, you know, you are... A, a representation of your sponsors. We've got all those basics down pat on camera. Now we speak. Structuring a sentence is really difficult. This comes back to obviously starting with part of the question at the beginning of your answer to keep it in context. What are some of the other things that we need to think about the structure of what we say? Point number one, listen to the question. That is super important. So listen to what's being asked of you. Try and get back to some absolute basics that you might have done at, at school or even at, at university. Who, what, when, why, that style of thing within the, the structure of your answer. Mm -hmm. If you can, um, take, take the audience on a, on a little journey so they feel a part of the answer. You're offering something of value. It is not a, it is not a wishy-washy answer. Um, you know, you talked about the questioning from the journalist before a good journalist um, will ask a good question if they're, if they're uh, not doing that. Um, some of the athletes that you'll, you'll see now, they just, they just don't engage in that way. There is a level of responsibility from the reporter to, to ask that question. So start with what Philippa has just mentioned in the, in the key checklist stuff first. Add some subtleties there, your cap, the background. If you were coming to my house for an in-depth interview, what's a nice background that that in my office or you know uh, uh, maybe there's some trophies and and old pictures or something that will help get get the message of, of who you are or your history and and things like that. Think about where you are in in the sporting space. If you're a young up and coming athlete, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? Um, understand that that in the early part of your career these are the kind of questions that are going to come up uh, more often than right, not right, right, so, so right. yeah so so it's not it's not the place for a wishy-washy answer because if you're passionate about your sport and and committed to trying to succeed and doing everything you can in that regard you should absolutely know what your charter is and where you want to go so share a little bit of that with with people at home what you know um let your guard down a little if you can, if, if, if your, uh, your body language and your answers and, and, and you're a bit shielded, you're not giving anything away. Like I said before, the camera and the audio pick that stuff up. If you can learn to, to engage with the reporter a little bit, relax a little and in the right moments, uh, have a little bit of a laugh or a smile or, or offer something that's slightly personalized that, that, so the audience learns a little something more about you, that will help you grow as as um, a, 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 as a brand. I, I don't often like using that, but that's yeah. that's a, that's the reality. But it also, yeah. But it also helps you grow in your level of comfort in these environments. You have to learn to be able to do a, a little bit of that in the right set of circumstances. And it's okay to prepare at home as well. Like you say, you know, take time 
before things get chaotic and you're winning races all the time and you've got lots of cameras in your face, work out who you are. What's your story? What's my goal? What do I want people to know about me? And even if you do need to think about the who I am, what have I done? When have I done it? Why am I doing this? Like, is it who, what, why, when, where, how? The, you know, the six fundamentals of journalism. Start crafting your story because if I'm interviewing you and you're a 15 year old go kart, and I say, So, Rusty, great to have you part of the Australian Karting Championship. Tell us a little about what you've done and why you're here this weekend. The last thing I want to hear is, Well, I started karting when I was like six. And I've sort of done some stuff around Australia and my dad helps me. And yeah, it's good to be here. That tells me nothing. And yeah, it shows that, that you're not prepared, right? So yeah, what, sort that, of con- what sort of detail could you have instead have said if you were young like that? Most definitely. And that gets back to what I was saying about, about dropping your guard a little bit. It's okay to, you don't, you don't have to share the inner secrecies of, of, um, uh, of discussions you are having with a team about 2022 or beyond or whatever that are private. Right. But what you can share is what you aspire to. The right. people that have um, motivated you, mentored you, um, uh, that you look up to immensely. So you're showing great respect for your chosen sport and the people that have come before you. Show some passion. Let that passion for what you do yeah. come through. and and. If you're recounting something about a race, don't just go with um, "I started fourth, I got to third at turn <laughs> one," and and you, yeah. you have to add you have to add some. That's just sort of minutia. You you have to give give, give me some, some something passionate. You know, um, far out. I nearly fired it off at turn one when I was battling <laughs> Philip. I don't know how I caught that thing. You know, like right. just something. Right? It's a little bit animated. It's a, it's a bit. You know, they're the kind of they're the kind of things. If people see that in you, because that's how you really felt in yeah. that moment. You nearly blew it for whatever reason, or you you only just got there. You nearly ran out of fuel, or or you know you made your final tumble turn in the fifteen hundred, and you're exhausted. But somehow you dug deep and you you found it. You know, so you, exactly. give, give us a bit of that. Working with a lot of younger teenagers overseas, I noticed the vocabulary is quite restricted. So one exercise I like to do with some of my kids is putting down the words like having a column for good words and bad words so if a race goes good what are the different words it was awesome it was fantastic it was overwhelming to win think of different ways to express the same thing and also for the negative as well because the last thing you want to hear in an interview is oh yeah the car's good the race was good I think I did a good job qualifying was not too bad but yeah we could have done better like that's really bland we want a bit of light and shade and a bit of color don't we but and highlight the word variety here different yeah. words to to show a, a, a similar thing that that absolutely um illustrates your your passion for whatever it is you're you're, you're talking about at the time so um, you don't have to, in a, in a radio sense, which you and I have both done, you know, you, you, you can talk about uh, inflection and intonation and what you do in your voice. We don't necessarily want you uh, to, 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 to do that. All we're asking for is a, is a little bit of polish in what you do. English may not have been your thing um, in school, but you can still watch what other athletes do, yeah. pick up a lot, learn a new word. It might, it might be just once a week you're, you're watching the news and you you see um, someone and, and, you know, you asked me before about, about daunting athletes. I, I worked on um, the Commonwealth Games, uh, Glasgow, Scotland coverage for, for Channel 10. And I, I had to do some stuff with Ian Thorpe. And I mean, at that stage of his career, I just thought he was, you know, this uh, huge superstar. And, and I was a little bit out of my comfort zone from, from what has mainly been automotive and, and motor racing. But I went away. I, I did a bit of homework. I tried to think of ways that I could perhaps unlock a little something in him, connect with him in some way, use the other assets to have some rapport with him. And if you've done a bit of that homework, um, it, people like Ian will will then open up a bit more to you. They they see that you're um, you know you're genuinely trying to do that stuff. So on the on the flip side, if you're the athlete. If you have prepared, you've thought about some better ways of saying things, tried to eliminate some of those safety words that we spoke about before, the more you do that stuff, that that little bit of homework every week, you know, your focus is the racing or the competition, the 80%, but that little bit of 20% every week where you've studied someone, picked up a little something, you just keep those building blocks and it keeps getting easier and better. 
And it also works in the other respect if you're an athlete in a particular championship. So say take the S5000s on the weekend and you're the driver in that championship over four or five rounds. You know who the TV crew is going to be. You know that Greg Russ is going to come down that pit lane at some point to interview across the year. It doesn't hurt to actually go up to people like you and go, look, hi, I'm Joe Bloggs. I'm racing car number five. I'm in this championship all year. Can I give you some information about you that if there's anything that I do that's spectacular that you need to interview me for some reason that you know a little bit more about me, that doesn't hurt either, does it? Don't be afraid to do that. I actually think it's an essential because you start to build a relationship with these people. And over time, no matter what the sport is, there is invariably this core group of, of journalists that will follow it for a great length of time. So these people, you know, they often talk about um, athletes not getting too close to the media in that scenario because media are meant to be, um, you know, removed remove from that and neutral and impartial and able to report on whatever it, it might be. But but if you forge a relationship with like uh, of that kind that you just talked about, that, Im- that Im- helps you immensely, but it also helps them a lot. If they know that you are forthcoming, you're helpful, you want to do, you know, um, more of that stuff, that relationship building, like anything in life, if you need that sponsor for your race car or whatever it is you're doing, you're, you're as, as much as it's a, a prop or whatever it might be, it's, it's also got to do with relationship. And that is absolutely key in the media sports person game as well. You've got to do that. And, and it helps you in two ways. Sometimes you can get to know that that journalist is, you know, maybe trustworthy to a point yeah. that, that um, you know, they can be perhaps a little controversial Mm. Um, you don't always know that if you haven't got a relationship with them and there, there can be some tense moments that come from all that stuff, but at least, you know, the animal, at least, you know, who you're dealing with right. and most importantly, what they are trying to achieve, but how you can still keep in control and get, and get the message of what you, you know, you're wanting to say and deliver. I remember the late Jace Richards was so great with media. Very good. I worked um, at Auto Action. I used to be a journalist at that magazine, which you well know. And I had built a great rapport with him at that point where someone else had done the dirty on some news and almost jeopardized a particular uh, contract that he had. So then he came to me to put the story on the the front page of Auto Action magazine. So you, you can build those relationships, but it just, it takes time. It takes respect. It takes patience, but being genuine, having the right intentions with the press is going to take you so far. And those journalists, whether it's TV reporters, radio reporters, print journalists, will cover your career extensively for the for the whole duration, hopefully, if you've built the relationships right. That, that's why building those relationships is so important. But what you've um, touched on here is awareness. It just helps you to understand who that person is, what yeah. they're like. Are they a little bit controversial or, or are they just, you know, just a genuine straight up reporter? Um, having a relationship and a level of rapport with them is important no matter what the outcome is here because it helps you with that awareness. Um, it's a little bit like a bank. Sometimes you'll you'll um, do some stuff um, with those guys, and but you know it will come back to you in another way later on if that makes sense as well. So if you're you know, stretched for time and, and um, you know, you're trying to get to the airport after a, a, a sporting meet or whatever, spending that little bit of extra time with those guys who are on a deadline or whatever it might be, that comes back to you in other ways, even though it may feel um, a drag or a bit intrusive at the time. Yeah. When you are young as well, you can't really rest on your laurels, can you? Because you do move from category to category to category if you want to move up to the ranks. If you want to be an F1 racer, you will start in karting. You move up to F4. You might go to a Formula Regional or you're you're meeting different category managers, different press, different TV reporters. So all of the things that we've talked about today isn't just you do it once. You will actually have to do this year upon year upon year until you can rest on your laurels in an F1 paddock because you are a Lewis Hamilton. You still need to put effort and work into it. But in those early years, it's so important to build those habits correctly from the start. I'm a huge believer that you never stop learning. So in, in the, the, the growth curve that you talked about, the moving through different categories, you are meeting new team owners, new engineers, new media, perhaps, if you've gone from racing in Australia to racing overseas. So in, in the same way that you apply yourself to, to do a good job with your racing and the people's skills that come with that, the relationships that come with that, you just need to invest. It is an investment of your time on the, the media uh, and sponsor side, knowing 
who these people are. I, I could, I could, you know, I used the Mark Scaife example a little earlier today. There are there are other um, drivers that do it as well. I mean, they walk into a room, they they will know sixty percent of the people, if not more, in there and what business mm-hmm. they're in, what they were doing before. They can reach out, um, say good day, uh, by first name. Um, that connectivity is a is a huge thing in the in the sponsor space. They they feel like you've personalized your, your moment with them. You, you have to get better at that stuff, you know, remembering names, remembering um, where they've been and what they're doing now. And, um, and shakers, they, they could influence you know, your career. I mean, I mean here's, a, here's a great one for you, Philippa. I mean, uh, Mark Webber works very closely with Sir Jackie Stewart, um, you know, Formula One legend. Sir Jackie's been a bit like a, like a father to him um, overseas. And invariably when they go to sponsor related functions, even in his, uh, his elderly years now, so Jackie Stewart is a machine and he will go from one event to the next while they're in the car. He's already pre-signed uh, autograph mm-hmm. things that they can hand out for fans. So he's got that job done. He's talking to the people in the car that are taking him to the function that have organized it about, okay, who's in the room? Yeah. Uh, who are we talking to? What do they want to know about? Do they know motor racing? Do they, so, so he, he's prepped and armed when he when he walks in, he, he he knows maybe a couple of great old yarns that he can share in the room that will will make people laugh and connect with them. He'll automatically know some of the key people um, in the room and to um, not in a fake way seek them out, but just he just knows that that's uh, it's important to give value um, in a in a personalised way with these with these people. So, so Jackie, um, even now. It researches, invests, prepares in the same way you prepare for your your sport, your race, your meet, whatever it is. You've got to do a bit of the same. You've got to invest in that on the media side. It's so important. What he does is outside the norm. And one of the things I teach my kids is if you are just doing half of this stuff, the majority of athletes aren't even doing any of it. So if you're looking for a way to stand out, just be proactive to start with. Here's a great example for you. So I've just been dealing with my nephews who play um, AFL football in, in Australia, a very popular code of football. And uh, they're in a, an academy for um, Greater Western Sydney. So, you know, it's a wonderful opportunity for them. Um, they're only, uh, you know, in their early teens and one of them not even quite a teenager yet. When they went to a, a very big event, recently some of the kids were a little bit shy they got given gift bags and things like that and my sister was big on encouraging my nephews to go up to to eyeball the key people to shake their hand to say thank you that, that's just a common courtesy simple thing in life but that little investment is a is a it leaves a wonderful impression with those people exactly. and and you build on it from there so so take that little example and, and just magnify it because if you're um you know, you're climbing the rung of whatever your chosen sport is. If you do that simple stuff, spend a bit of time. We, you and I both got to know um, uh, Peter Brock during his career. I mean, he was unbelievably good at staying until the lights were almost about to be switched off so that every fan, uh, every person in the media, whatever it was, felt like they'd had their time, felt like they connected. Um, you, but by doing that stuff, it pays immense dividends the other way. And then that just that socialising yeah. helps you as well when it comes to the on-camera stuff that we've been, been talking about today. Absolutely. How rewarding is it for you doing coaching and seeing young athletes take all this advice and actually using it down the track when they've become somebody overseas? I know Joey, who won S5000 on the weekend, was someone that you've worked with in the past. And, and he's still growing. And we did an interview, Philippa, um, on the Friday before the race meeting even began. Once the camera was turned off, he, he, he sort of edged forward in his seat and he, he said, how'd that go? What, what can I do more of? What was... <laughs> right. And yeah. we, we, had a, we had a frank little conversation about try this or do that. And, and um, so to me, that's tremendous. That uh, All I really did before he, he went overseas was, was a, um, you know, a, probably a bit, a bit like a conversation that we're having now and just a bit of advice. But he, he took that. Um, sometimes you've got to apply it to Philippa in the space that you're playing. So, you know, Chad Reed has been very good at, at um, developing a couple of what I would almost call Americanisms that, that, you know, he says certain words that are clearly the American vernacular. Um, it almost appears like, a, like an accent at times. But he's still very much an Australian. Yeah. But 
but that just shows in that marketplace that he's done his homework and, and he, he's worked hard to, to get that acceptance of, of the place that he now calls home where he's competing. And that's a, another, another piece of research or homework that he'd gone and done. Yeah, connect, because we relate to people. We don't relate to the results sheets. You know, we want to be able to um, be entertained. And that's what you want your audience to think is that you could be their best mate and then anyone could come up to you and say hi and get an autograph. So you're not going to be intimidating. I think the only athlete that can get away with having a stone cold face is Kimi Raikkonen, but he's <laughs> <laughs> he's had a career of, of developing a, a character per se for his personalities. He's a little bit left field of an example. Ironically, the aura around him from some of the crazy YouTube clips of stuff that's happened away from the track yeah. has probably made you understand that there is this wonderful other side to Kimi. Uh, to, to your point, um, a bit of personality, walk that tightrope where you you can let your guard down a little bit let us see the real you be genuine from the get-go it's got to come from the heart it's not an act you don't have to be some sort of uh crazy character i mean uh, i mean the, the wonderful things valentino rossi used to do at the height of his career where he'd have these zany post-race celebrations that's a true valentino rossi he loves that stuff so it immediately resonated with people because that's what he was really like. Barry Sheen was very good to me in the latter part of his life and, and in the earlier part of my, my broadcasting career. And in that window, I got to see a little of how he operated and, and we loved him in this country. We didn't probably fully know that he was like a rock star in the UK. He was kind of like one of the Beatles. Yeah. And, and the reason Baz was so good was not just that he was a two-time world champion in, in 500cc motorcycle racing, it was also to do with the immense, true, real character that he was yeah. off track. Yeah. And, and he maximised a lot of the stuff around that, but it was the true Baz, and, and that's what resonated with people. And that's got to be reflected in everything you do, your right. social media, your interviews with whoever it is. Start with that genuine Thing. You know, we, we've seen it so beautifully with Daniel Ricciardo. Formula One for, for a long time had, had perhaps been a little Euro, not, not stale, but, but just the personalities. Daniel brought this wonderful, uh, fun approach, you know, the, and that's his true personality. And it's, it's, it's worked for him, not, not because it was a... Um, you know, a thing he set out to create or do. That's the real Daniel Ricciardo. Yeah. Yeah. But you can't afford to be fake, like you're saying before. Everyone can pick it. And so too, when we have these things around, Definitely. you cannot really be switched off because fans are filming you, people recognise you in the street, they could catch you. So behaviour is so important as well, not just during an interview, but at any point in time when you're out of your house, you are still representing yourself and your code and your sponsors too. So don't be too lapsed in the way that you act away from the field, the track, the court, things like that. Just, just you know, without scaring yourself, but just, just that little voice in the back of your head that makes you think about things. If you're going out with some friends and we, we, we all want to do that, put your phone away. Don't take it or, or something along those lines. Do the right thing because everyone else out there has got a phone. I know that makes life hard for a lot of athletes, but that is a reality of... of the world we now live in. Um, think about things, you know, if you're doing a Facebook Live with someone, has it completely stopped and finished yet? So you don't, you don't, you know, oh mate, how Evan good was that? Because you're not, you're not done yet. Yeah, right? yeah, so just correct. just keep a little bit of that in the in the back of your mind. Live streaming is another another great one. I mean, I had I had a faux pas in my my career, Philippa, and I'm very fortunate it didn't go into you know something bad. It was in the very early days of live streaming. Um, we were doing a, a broadcast. A a basketball grand final was on prior to our Formula One coverage, and the game went into extra time. Yeah. So naturally, they kept following the basketball game. Uh, we were on set, all good to go for Formula One, and it started eating into our, our F1 coverage, but, but that's okay. We were going to join it as soon as the, the basketball grand final was done. In the live streaming world, what happened, the pictures that were going to people's phones or computers or whatever was the basketball, mm. but the audio um. was being taken from our studio with Formula One. 
And at the time, I love impersonations. I, I do that stuff away from camera, which is quite fun. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I was kind of doing a, a full Ray Warren impersonation call of the basketball. And <laughs> and uh, so on the on the Monday morning, I got this, you know, could I please come in and see the management? And oh, they were no. trying to allay my fears. I said, it's all right. It's all right. We've actually had some funny emails about this and it's okay. And I was very lucky for eight minutes. Yeah. I, mean, I, ne I never swore or I never said anything defamatory or whatever. The great little lesson in all that is have fun. But just keep in the back of your mind, is it, is it, are we done? Is it actually off air? Are we finished yet? And that this is little things, hold your smile, hold your, your connection with the reporter and things like that until you absolutely know that it's off and done. Well, I'm sure if any athlete watching this is interviewed by you for Rusty's Garage, then you're definitely going to be telling them when they're on and when they're <laughs> I try, I try. Right, we're away now, Philippa, yes. <laughs> Actually, if you're an athlete and you're looking for inspiration to listen to interviews that Rusty's done, he has spoken to some of the biggest names in sport on his podcast. It's called Rusty's Garage. Subscribe, it's available through Podcast One. New episodes out every two, three weeks. I have one out every every three weeks and I, I love to try and unearth some of the backstories and hopefully some of those help help young racers. So yeah, thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time today. I couldn't have asked for a more productive workshop to talk about being on camera, doing interviews, hopefully all the things that we've discussed has given some younger athletes some inspiration and some things to think about next time that they get interviewed by the press. So thank you for being part of the Masters and part of the Media Master Coach family. I hope we can do this again soon. Absolutely. It's been a, been a pleasure. I love trying, I feel a little bit of a responsibility to try and give back in, in some ways. Be be genuine, be authentic, apply yourself, go and learn from what some of the, the greats are doing and just never stop learning. That's the key thing. For more information on media coaching, particularly if you need help with being confident on camera and also how to perform, prepare and succeed in interviews, head to our website, mediamastercoach.com. You can check out our VIP one-on-one -on -one programs that we do directly with athletes. Also our workshop options, if you are a part of a sporting team, sporting code, or a commercial organization that works with athletes as well. If you also want some basic tips on interviews to take away from this episode, send us an email, hello at mediamastercoach.com and we'll send you our successful interview playbook. I hope you enjoyed this episode with so much valuable advice to take away from our workshop with Greg Rust. I look forward to working with you soon and bringing more episodes of The Masters to our YouTube channel as well. 